Hey, it's Katie Moran with Artistic Spirit. Today I'm here with Samantha Lane, who was once a high functioning workaholic in 2014. A surgery gone wrong shifted her perspective on life and forever changed her relationship with time. She created Origami Day as a way to share her life changing lessons philosophy, and planning tools with others. Now, Smith is a speaker, coach, and helping others find work-life balance through time management. She empowers audiences to be more present in their lives and more productive in their days through the power of planning. Thank you so much for being here, Samantha. Thank you. It's great to chat with you today, Katie. So I'd love to just jump right in and talk about how can creatives manage their time better. Specifically, um, writers say they had a plan for 2024 and how to how to manage their time with writing and all the other things they're juggling. And this is really when they might have hit a wall in the first month of January and realized that they need to switch um, their strategy. So what would you say to those people right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... So the, I teach a lot around what I call the three pillars of time management. So pillar number one is prioritization. Uh, pillar number two is planning. And pillar number three is protecting your plan and yourself. Mm. And so uh, we could go very deep into any one of those pillars. But I think for sort of to best answer your question, if people are starting to feel like they're falling off the wagon and they need to sort of recalibrate, then they should consider focusing on pillar number two, which is planning. And I would encourage people to develop a weekly planning habit. That is the cornerstone of what I preach and teach. And it is what changed my life dramatically and helped me to be a higher functioning person. Um, And so with that, I usually tell people choose one day a week for a lot of people who work Monday through Friday, Friday is the best day to do this and take time every Friday to have a positive experience that involves planning. So light candles, pour yourself a cup of coffee, put happy music on and sit down and write out what your schedule is, your to-do list, your agenda for the next seven days. And if you do that week after week on Fridays, you will no longer have Sunday scaries. You will no longer feel reactive. You'll begin to move through your days with peaceful productivity and be able to actually do the things that you said I want to do. Um, and so I I have a planning tool that I, that I share with people so that they can start beginning that process. But really, it doesn't matter how you plan necessarily. I mean, we could get into those nuances. Mm. But the moral of this story is to take time once a week and plan how you will be intentionally spending your time. That's so important. Um, I see a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of writers, there's this kind of like thing with writers, it's like pantsers and plots, plotters. And like, there's these people who just kind of like write and like they free write. And then there's these people who have like intricate plans mm-hmm. and it's like right down to the detail. And for those people who really have the planning um, well put together, what can you say to them about protecting those plans? Because I know other things in life can get in the way. Mm, Yeah, there'll always be other demands for your time. And there'll always be, there's an innate likelihood that plans will change. And for many of us were part of 2020. And we saw that you could have all the plans in the world, but that was our gentle reminder that we can't control everything. And so Some plans cannot be changed, but many plans can be protected and can be maintained. And so what I encourage people is a couple different things. One would be default to saying no. Um, So when something tries to change your plan, instead of just agreeing to it, maybe stop and say, do I actually have to, to embrace this change? So whether it's my phone is ringing, we would often default to answering that phone call. But for many of us, we can stop and say, do I actually need to answer this phone call right now? Um, Or can I say no to it? And a lot of times too, if people are not comfortable fully saying no, it helps us to think, well, maybe I'm also saying not now. I am going to take this phone call, but I'm not going to take it right now because it's not actually urgent. I'm going to let it go to voicemail and I'll return that call when I'm done with this wonderful wave of creative energy that I'm experiencing. So, so I think that would be the first one is to help people default to a state of no or not now. And then, you know, there's lots of other things like proactively setting yourself up for success. Try to avoid the things that are going to change your plan in advance. And um, and then there's reframing your mindset, realizing that you're allowed to say no. It's okay to say no. Uh, enforcing the plan that you set out to create is okay. I and mean, then sometimes it's essential and it's good. So there, there's a lot in, that's why I call them pillars more than topics, because there's so much we could talk about within each of the pillars. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you would say to someone, say they have a nine to five and Mm -hmm. um, their default of saying no is saying no to their creative work. 
um, Mm -hmm. and not scheduling time for what really lights our soul on fire. Um, What would you say to them specifically because your background came from um, feeling like you were a workaholic to feeling like you had the power to have this freedom? And Mm -hmm. I'm just curious how you would how you would give someone advice in this situation? Yeah, great question. So uh, if it's okay with you, I'm going to share a little extra context around this answer. So we've already touched on that I was previously a little bit of a workaholic. I thought that the American dream was to go to school and get a degree and get a job and just give everything you had to your job and that that would equal happiness. Uh, which for me, it didn't. And it, if it does for other people, that's great. I'm never one to say what people should or should not do. I'm just here to say, here are the things that helped me do things my way. So um, one of those things was reframing my mindset. And I part of what prompted this change for me is I ended up having a surgery. I had to have my chest cut open and I had a ton of complications and it very quickly helped me realize, oh my gosh, my, my time is limited. My time is beyond my control. Um, I have no idea what's around the next corner. And most importantly, I've been doing it wrong. My priorities were wrong. I was putting this emphasis on working for someone else's dreams and not even giving myself a chance to consider what what were my dreams. And so after this incident, I remember going to a time management workshop and the facilitator shared a quote by Annie Dillard that said, how we are spending each day is in fact how we are spending our lives. And that really hit home for me. And so I think that would be the first thing that I would encourage these people to think about is, this is your life. This is, this is it. As far as we know, (laughs) this is your time here. Um, It's, we go through these motions and we sometimes get on autopilot. We focus on the task at hand. I've got to get up. I've got to get dressed. I've got to get in the car. I've got to go to the office. I've got to do the things. And then, and we don't realize like what we're doing. That's our life. That's our existence. That's it. And so really helping people to understand the power of your time and to say, does my calendar line up with what I feel is important to my existence? That's sort of, and that's kind of a heavy topic for a lot of people because possibly by the end of this episode, people will have a a huge existential awakening if we're lucky. Um, But then once you have that sort of mindset, the the biggest piece is that mindset shift and then just saying, okay, well, what's one thing I can do? What's one thing I can do today to be able to not defer my dreams anymore? Um, What is one thing I can do to bring my writing into my forefront, into my day-to-day instead of just letting, letting it be a hope in something that I don't ever actually get to do? Um, I've dealt with this personally. I, I, I have considered myself a writer. I love writing. I've written for work all the time, but was I ever writing for my own joy or for my own creative outlet? Um, for a long period of time, I wasn't. And so it was one reframing my mindset to say I can, and I should write and now is the time. And then allowing sort of some space in my day to do that, uh, whether that's first thing in the morning or at the end of the day or whatever that looks like different for everybody, but it's that, that piece of like, getting your mind around the the value of it and then giving a little bit of time to start the habit. Yeah, I think that's so powerful. And, um, you know, something I've noticed that I've done, sometimes I'll procrastinate and I'll be like, this is going to take a lot of time. So I started actually timing certain things that I would do. And before I would go into it, I would be like, oh, I don't have the time for that now. And then I would be like, actually, like I'm going to set a timer and it'll only be this amount of time. Um, So do you ever find that people's perception of how much time they have and the reality of what they can get done in the time that they have is different? Absolutely. And I just think people's perception of time in general is Mm -hmm. completely different. So this is why I encourage people to stop thinking about time as a Mm -hmm. concept Mm -hmm. and start thinking about time as a measuring unit. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying later or one day or eventually, I think we should start saying Tuesday or 2 p.m. like or 30 minutes. Like it is a measuring unit in that is that is when we can reframe our mindset to see it as such. Then we are no longer thinking about our life as concepts. We're thinking about now our life as actionable steps towards what we want. This is also why I encourage people to plan on paper, because paper is really a way to take the concept of time and move it from infinite to finite because a piece of paper is only so big. A box on a calendar is only so big. And it keeps us in check with the reality of our time versus letting us think that we have this infinite amount of time. Like, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but um, we don't. Our clocks already started ticking. 
we we only have 24 hours in each day, 168 hours in a week. And frankly, Katie, you and I don't know how many days or weeks we get. Mm -hmm. So the thing is our time as a concept, sure, time conceptually is infinite, but our time, it's finite. So thinking about it that way is how we actually can feel some of that pressure to act, even if we can't do the whole thing. What can we do right now? Mm -hmm. So switching gears, I'd love to hear what you have to say about um, writing about your own life and kind of like, what does it take? Um, And do you ever find that it's harder for people to put in the time to write things that are more vulnerable um, because they're going deeper? And does that like shift a perception of time? Yeah, great question. So when I first started my business, I didn't ever tell people that the the origin story, like the the impetus was almost dying, was my own surgery gone wrong and my reality of sort of being connected with my own mortality. And the reason I didn't do that is because I felt like it wasn't about me. People didn't care about me. They care about the, the solution for them, which I thought was talking about the products that I sold. What I realized over time was that um, people relate to experiences. And although you have probably not had your chest cut open and had massive complications, uh, to really be able to connect with that experience, you have probably had a plan change for the worse. So you could relate to that experience. Mm -hmm. And so for me, realizing that it wasn't, I could tell my story without making it about me. I could write about my experiences while still emphasizing and focusing on the outcome for the reader. And so that change started to become clear in my monthly email and in blog posts and even in, you know, verbal discussions um, or writing, writing bullet points for a news interview. All those things sort of shifted because I found a way to tell my story in a way that kept the focus on what was important, which was how the reader would experience my story. Mm-hmm. And I think that was really helpful. And I think what what also is often helpful is if we write about um if we write about things that are in our rearview mirror versus things that are in our passenger seat, mm-hmm. that's easy too because we have the, you know, we've got the uh the power of hindsight and we know more. We've we fell over we're past it. So we have the ability to look back and speak about it differently versus sometimes it is really complicated to write about things in real time because we're still processing it. And so we may not, we may feel more nervous about sharing the unfiltered feelings. So um, I guess those are some of my thoughts regarding that question. Yeah, actually, so I, I talk to a lot of people about this idea of speaking from your scars and not your wounds. And mm-hmm. um, I forget yeah. where I've heard it, but I always go through this process. Like if it's something really hard that happens in my life, like before I could really talk about it. I have to kind of like take those actions of healing and kind Mm -hmm. of like whether it's like do something that like on that topic that makes me feel like I'm helping people or that like my experience is in some way helping other people gain insights or feel less alone and things like that and that it's really a process. So I just am curious, do you feel like when you first started talking about your story, did you have to do a lot of self-care to kind of like nurture that? Did you have the process of turning it from a wound to a scar? Uh, Yeah. And I think my process was to process. Mm -hmm. So I like to do what I call marinate on things. And so I think for me, I don't like to do things if I don't feel right about them. If they don't, I don't feel you know, confident, we are way more confident in things we understand. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was taking time to understand what had happened to me. Uh, There were layers of it for me. There was the, there was a physical component of what it's like to you, for your body to completely change and for your body to become a liability. Um, That was a great experience in prioritization too, because in the past I was like, oh my gosh, this proposal is the most important thing of my day. And during my recovery, I was like, you know, not dying, not having my incisions reopened. That's the most important important part of my day. So there's sort of the, the forced reframing, the forced pri- reprioritization that was really helpful. And so then taking the time to process the physical trauma was one thing. And then taking the time to understand how the complications got so bad, which part of that was just some 
difficulty between myself and the medical staff, mm-hmm. you know, there, I had to advocate for myself. Mm-hmm. And so when we are forced to advocate for ourselves, whether it is something like a medical situation or a professional situation or a personal situation that can kind of create this stress of like, almost like imposter syndrome, or am I wrong? Like gaslighting, all these things sort of come up when we have, when we're having to fight for something that people maybe aren't mm-hmm. right away getting behind. And so that it took me time to process that. And so I guess the short answer to this question is, um, my process was to process, Mm -hmm. to let the things sit and settle, feel what I was feeling, give myself space and time to be okay with it. And then slowly to say, okay, almost like layers, like what am I comfortable talking about now? And then what am I comfortable talking about now? And then maybe a little bit later, now, what am I comfortable talking about? And giving myself the space to not feel pressured to speak about what I wasn't ready to speak about or write about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, going deeper into that, did you feel that it was a different process to get to a place where you felt like you could write about what you went through compared to kind of like the process of getting to a place where you felt like you could speak about what you went through? were those different that's an that's funny you say that because oddly um I found that with my surgery it's been different for different things Mm -hmm. I feel like with my surgery I was able to speak about it before I was able to write about it Mm -hmm. but with other significant things uh like a, a recent loss that I experienced I could write about it and I still have a hard time even speaking about it. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. I don't, I don't know what that means. Mm-hmm. I'm still processing that. I'm still marinating on that. But, but for me, it was easier to speak about my story as it pertained to that chapter of my life. Mm-hmm. Bef- it was, that was easier than writing about it mm-hmm. uh, versus this more recent experience has been a little bit harder to speak about it, but I've been much more comfortable writing about it. But actually, hold on, let me clarify this. I'm writing about it, but I'm sharing that writing with almost no one. Mm-hmm. So the writing is the therapy right now. Mm-hmm. It, the therapy is the processing. The The writing is the, the marinating. Mm-hmm. I think that's so, so important to make a distinction that, that sometimes it takes time to like have these different platforms and to hone your voice on like different issues, like in different spaces. And I know um, there's a bunch of people in my community who are writing memoirs and also um, aiming to speak about their story. So I think that will be something that really resonates with people is this idea that um, it might have to be like a different process to get to the keyboard than it is to get to the microphone. And I think that differentiation is just something to always remind yourself to have compassion and mm-hmm. like, there's no reason to like have self judgment if one seems harder than the other, and if you need to take more time. And I love how you talk about the only way to process it is to process it, um, because it's so true. Like, um, I think a lot of people just don't understand like what it takes to kind of like come from a place where you own your story. And that you kind of like give it away to other people so that they can Mm -hmm. take something. And again, it's not like when you do that, it's not so much the story belongs to you. It becomes something different and it becomes like this entity of its own that it's what every person kind of like feels in their own heart when they experience it. Um, And I'm just curious, do you ever feel like what's the experience for you to know that your story is something that is so unique to you? And then you share it with other people and kind of like how it feels to you isn't exactly how it's going to feel to someone else. And that someone could take something from your story that you don't even feel like is a big part, but can be so transformational for them in their journey. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. Wow. There was so much there that you just said. Um, uh, I do want to first also emphasize that, like, I do think it's, it's important for people to realize that as they process and write about things, then no two things will will necessarily even take the same course. So mm-hmm. I think it's another good reminder for people to give themselves that space and grace. Um, as far as, you know, how how people take different points of the story, the writing, the wording, um, that's been interesting to me. Um, 
again, because so much of me sharing my story in writing and in speaking has been de-emphasizing myself as Mm -hmm. a character. Mm -hmm. It has been really trying to focus on other parts. And that was my own journey of having to figure out like, like I could be a lead character in my story without that being a negative thing. Mm -hmm. And so with that though, understanding that everyone's going to see the same thing differently. And so there's, this is one of the reasons when I first started speaking, I don't, I didn't use slides. I still use slides very rarely when I do public speaking, because what I think is worth writing down and highlighting a slide might not be the part that really stands out to you. So in all of my presentations, trainings, things like that, I encourage people take notes and write down what speaks to you because it's always going to be something different. Um, I do try very hard though, to make sure that at the end of um, something that is written or something that is spoken, that if there is a theme that is so powerful that I want people to hear it, that I emphasize it enough and try to say it in as many different ways that the bigger theme would be mm-hmm. taken. And I think that's part of the challenge we have as writers mm-hmm. is to be able to convey the theme, um, get the point across, don't bury the lead. Um, mm-hmm. And so that is, even if there's other nuanced messages that people take, that is always, so I send an email once a month. Um, People, you know, marketers will tell you to send emails all the time. Like I only send it once a month and there's always a theme and a focus and an intention. And so that is one of my challenges to myself as a writer is to make sure that theme is, is authentic and clear and powerful and useful versus, you know, there's tons of little tangents of value that people will get out of the rest of it. But to me, it's a successful message when someone closes that email and then they say, okay, I get what the, the I know what I'm supposed to know now. And it's this, and it's very clear and specific. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm curious to go back to the beginning of time management. What exactly is the prioritization pillar? Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a big one. Usually um, I I help people to identify. We talk about like, what do you where should your time be going? Um, I I hate to say should because that sounds like someone's telling you, but like, where do you want your time to be going? Mm -hmm. And so is that how do you identify that there's, um, do you have a vision somewhere? I encourage people like have a vision. Where do you want your life to look like? What do you want your life to look like one year from now? Um, have goals, make sure they're specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time bound. Um, do you have performance metrics in your job? Do you you know, how do you know you're succeeding in your day-to-day job? Do you have, um, do you have a job description? A lot of times that job description is looked at once when you apply for the job, but then never again, when the reality is that's the agreement you made with your company Mm -hmm. about what you are supposed to be doing. So that job description can serve as sort of a guidance on prioritizing your time. And then my favorite is the Eisenhower urgency matrix, which is a tool that helps you reflect on things based off of urgency and importance and just helping people to to be reflective of with that construct. Um, Because at the end of the day, your priorities will be different than mine and and they yours may even be different than you a month from now mm-hmm. but the 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 whole hope is that people are constantly checking in with those priorities so that they know that their time is in alignment with what they said was important that's so interesting uh, that you talk about how your priorities one month from the next month can be different um and just this idea that not every priority is urgent and that not everyone is important and that some are both um I think that's really important for people here specifically if they haven't come across those ideas before I I am familiar with the matrix but um I think sometimes sometimes we can tell ourselves something is more important than it is or something Uh, is more uh urgent than it is Um, so what would you say to people who have a habit, have a habit of, um, misidentifying what's urgent and important? Um, it's important to have like, uh, what's the word I want to use for this? Like almost like something that you can use to recalibrate or recenter. Mm -hmm. So, um, how do I put this into something quickly, easily relatable. So like, um, if you, if you start to veer off course and you start to think things are important, it's good to have something that can bring you back to center, which Mm -hmm. is why I like that vision. Um, encouraging people to say, what do I want my life to look like one year from now? And Mm -hmm. and create that Mm -hmm. because then that can, it's a little more broad usually, but it can help you recenter. And you can sort of say like, maybe one of the things I envisioned was, 
Um, I'll use one that was a past one for me. I wanted to move closer to the beach. I wanted to be live closer to the ocean. And so in the day to day, so that's the, the bigger vision, but then in the day to day, are my actions moving me closer to the beach in some way? And if they are, then great. And if they aren't, then I need to maybe consider if this is, is this doing something else within my vision? Or is this something that's actually in a misalignment? Does that make sense? And answer that question kind of like, yeah. like we need that bigger lighthouse mm-hmm. so that when the waters are rocky, we can see where the land is. Yeah, I love that specifically because I live by the beach and I actually did this um, exercise that I read about and I got seashells, like five seashells. Um, and I wrote like my top five priorities for the year on them. Ooh, um, I love that. Yeah. And every day I take it out of the jar I have them in. And then when I work on that one, I put it in the jar. And like the most important lesson isn't that I'm necessarily doing more, but it's that I see the things I don't get to. And it like makes me reflect like, why is this like, for example, like, why is this my number three priority if I'm always doing four and five before it? And just like kind of those reflections and kind of like asking yourself, like, how can I be more honest with myself so that I am prioritizing things? Because I think I'm definitely one of those people who <laughs> misidentifies what's um, urgent and important. And um, I think sometimes like I had this coach who used to say that time management is really emotional management. Yeah, and it's that and energy management. Yeah, I really see it because I like just like when I tell myself like, oh, this is going to take longer than I have time for. And then I'll be like, I actually time how long it takes and and it's only 30 minutes or like it's only 15 minutes and I have the time for that. Um, So what what are your thoughts on this idea of emotional management and energy management? Yeah, so I think more in the I'm definitely more in the energy management space, because I think our emotions actually would direct our energy, like Mm -hmm. a good emotion gives you more energy, a bad Mm -hmm. emotion would probably give you less energy. Mm -hmm. So I think more about it as energy management, um, which this goes also into what I work a lot with people on to is identifying like your peak performance time, Mm -hmm. and identifying when in each day you have a peak and a trough and a rebound, and utilizing those things, because at the end of the day, um, Hmm. Okay. We're going to zoom it out for a second. Mm -hmm. So effective time management is, um, it's not necessarily increasing efficiency. That's certainly part of it, but it's also increasing effectiveness. So we want to make sure that we're working as efficiently as possible and that we're working effectively as well. So we're doing things, uh, without waste, Um, and we're doing the right things without waste. And so part of how we do that is we cannot make more time. That's the harsh reality of life. Our time is set. So what we can do though, is be more effective with the time we have so that we are working quicker or smarter, not harder. And then hopefully we have a surplus of time that we can then pour back into either additional tasks, if that's where we are or into our life lives. Um, so like, we want to make sure that we are doing that through one of the best ways to do that is to reach a state of flow where our output exceeds our input. So there's certain ways that we can reach flow. And one of those ways is by focusing on the right things at the right time, utilizing that energy management. So um, there's a book called When by Daniel Pink, and he talks about identifying your peak performance time. And he has a formula, which is a great resource for people to check out. And that's sort of based on your circadian rhythm. So you go to sleep at a certain time would dictate more of when your peak performance time is. So what I try to help people do is identify when is that peak performance time. So you know, your energy is good. And then, so there, therefore mm-hmm. you are in a good place to reach efficiency, but let's also then focus during that time on your most important tasks or projects or the things that are most draining or difficult for you. So that way now we're pairing that e- efficiency with effectiveness. So now we're taking something, um, look, tell me one project that you just like hate doing in your day-to-day. Um, features. Um, so like okay. putting together like <laughs> word tags, like copy pasting the, the input of like the form I have and putting it on my website. Okay. So the features, so you hate the features. So there's two ways you could tackle the features. You could tackle the features during your your anytime, just whenever you're like, oh, I procrastinated this enough. I got to do the features now. Mm-hmm. And that could take you, let's just say a feature would take you, I'm just going to make something up. It takes you two hours. 
Um, I'm sure it doesn't take that long, but um, <laughs> that for this conversation, <laughs> we're going to say you do it during a low energy time and it takes you two hours mm. or you can do that same project that you equally hate and you could do it during a higher energy cycle. Mm. And now instead of it taking you two hours, you're doing it in 30 minutes because you're doing it when you are in a better place, your energy increases your effectiveness and you're being effective by focusing on the right project. Does that make sense? It's like a whole sort of zoom yeah. out we did there. <laughs> you know, that makes me, now that we like specifically honed on honed in on something, it makes me have more questions about this idea of task switching and like kind of yeah. like, oh yeah, like how do you manage your time when you feel like, when you feel like the task switching makes something feel feel like it takes more time than it actually does and like something might not take a long time but kind of like the mental load of it because you're doing so many different like mental task switching in a short amount of time that it's almost like painful um yeah I would encourage people not to do that is the number yeah. one thing like so, so part of energy management too is like an effectiveness and efficiency is working on things in blocks or batches mm. so like um I love the concept of like you wouldn't wash your socks one sock at a time so mm. like how what is the equivalent of that in your work day mm. and so are you you know email is a great example here because people a lot of people will they have the notification that comes up that distracts them and then they address that email and then they've stopped doing whatever else they were doing. And then they try to go back to that other project. And then they're, they've got that on-ramp time, that time it takes mm -hmm. to get mentally and, you know, back into the project. And then it's, it just de kills efficiency mm -hmm. versus if you just said, I'm only going to check my email three times a day, once first thing in the morning, once midday, once at the end of the day. Well, now we've batched that a little bit better. So now we're not, we're, we're able to then focus with good energy in those other blocks of time and to be able to increase our output so that we have a surplus of energy because it's taken us less time to get the same work done. That's so interesting. What would you say about those tasks that um, you might not necessarily be able to block because like there, there, there's just so much task shifting in in between like the actual doing of it like would you would you say like come up with a better process um or like um say like you're putting something together and you have to like put pictures and you have to like put um text and like you're going to all these different folders to get all these different things um is it something like a muscle you develop or is it something that you just have to have like better systems I would say the systems before mm -hmm. developing the muscle. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say, have you created a good structure? Mm -hmm. So part of it too, with efficiency and effectiveness is we, there's things that you can do. And then it's like a, it's like an onion you create. So let's say a lot of people that come to me, we first start with their personal habits. Mm -hmm. Are you making a plan every week? Do you have notifications shut down on your devices? Are you creating a are you doing the base level stuff that helps you to prioritize, to plan effectively and to protect and execute that plan? So they're sort of the first thing. And those people usually, let's say we give them 25% of their time back almost immediately mm -hmm. through something as simple as weekly planning. Um, and you know, the, the base, the base stuff. So let's say this person was working 50 hours a week and now we've gotten them below, like they're, they're like, I'm getting all my work done in less than 40 hours a week. Or maybe let's just hold on. Let me give a better example. They're working 60 hours a week and we got them down to 50 hours a week. And now we're like, okay, we want to get farther down. So at some point, then we have to go to the next layer. And that next mm -hmm. layer is usually automation and delegation. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we have to go back through and we have to say, are we in fact, are you in fact focusing on the right things at the right time? Um, and then are you in fact the one who should do these things? And is there anywhere that we can create further structure, process, workflow, support, so that you are doing the part that just you need to do the part that requires you or that you're able to do the most difficult part during your peak performance time and maybe there's some lighter work that has to happen during your uh you know trough time does that it's i'm we're starting to get into like the weeds on like time management it is such mm -hmm. a deep deep well which is the other thing too like people are just like it's like making a plan or writing having a calendar like no 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 real effective time management is so much more. And I mean, I have clients that I've coached for um, over a year and mm -hmm. we're still 
we're still making progress with them. And it's neat mm -hmm. because it is such an iterative process. And it is like, you know, okay, if we both are people who live by the beach, it's the waves. The waves come in and they go out and they come in and they go out and they come in and they come out. But slowly over time, you know, the shells that wash up, wash up farther and farther up the shore because every time that wave comes in, it goes a little bit farther. And that's really what time management is. When you do it right, you're, you're moving it farther and farther along because you're kind of building off of things that, that you've developed specifically around those three pillars I mentioned, and then just like taking it deeper, which, so for your example, um, yeah, process would be where I'd start. Or I'd say, what, how do we upstream this? Mm -hmm. How do we look at this and say, are we, are we hacking at the branches when we should be addressing the roots? Mm -hmm. um, what do you love about what you do? So like, many things. Yeah. Like what is it that it's like, <laughs> that's just like, oh, if I can just like do this one more time in the day, like it's like, it'll be like <laughs> the best day ever. That's so hard because I already once said today, like I just started a new cohort of my business owner group coaching mm -hmm. just started today. And I turned to my husband, and I said, this is like my favorite thing that I do. And then like three days prior, I was working with a bunch of pastors and I was like, this is like my favorite thing that I do. <laughs> and then like tomorrow I get to go work with like um, a branch of the military. And I'm like, this is like my favorite thing that I do. So like, I, I don't know. That's so hard. I, I think like, <sighs> I'm guilty of that too. My favorite thing. Well, <laughs> well, I think because time management is such a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. We all struggle with time management. Everyone. It's one of the things that is so pervasive among every demographic. Yet no one teaches us this in elementary school. Mm -hmm. And so like for me, like the, well, I think the best thing that I do is when I get to see the change. Like I don't just sell products or coach people. I, I create transformation. And that's something that I think is probably the best thing is no matter who it's with or how they get there. Like my favorite thing is when I get to witness the transformation and see that someone now is spending more time with their spouse or their grandkids or at the beach mm -hmm. or writing their book because we have helped swat, like minimize the gnats that they're swatting at and really help them to focus on the thing that's important. I don't know. I'm, I feel spoiled. I say it all the time. Like I, I'm spoiled getting to do what I do. Um, so going deeper on that and specifically like getting back into your story. So you had this breakthrough, which I think is something that people can relate to, but you had the courage to make a change. And I think I've seen a lot of people who have a breakthrough, but they don't make any changes and they feel stuck and they almost have this like awareness that they'd rather be doing something else, but their body isn't actually taking action on it. And I would just be so curious to know, what do you think it is that gives someone courage after a breakthrough to pursue a new path? So it's interesting that you use the word courage. And I'm trying to think about, was it courage or was it, um, I don't know if it was courage for me as much as it was like, um, so courage feels like there's a, there's, um, a push towards something, mm -hmm. which is true. Mm -hmm. I saw the life I wanted. And so I thought I should just go get it. There was also the part where it was a push away from something. Mm -hmm. I'm so sick of this life of imbalance. I hate feeling frazzled and, feeling like I'm not spending time with my loved ones or that, you know, like, so there was also the push away from that, which to me was not courageous. Mm -hmm. It was, it was more like, I'm over it. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, I don't know the the simple or inspiring word for that, but I was just like fed up. Like, mm -hmm. so there was probably equal parts courage. Like I want this vision. I want to, to make it to this place where, where I'm having much more peace than pressure in my days. Mm. But then there was also the part where I was just like, I am not doing this anymore. Um, this, if this is what it's all about, I want no part of it. So there was also a, a certain amount of like, um, just like, I almost threw my hands up and I was like, I don't even care anymore. There was a sense of um, non, not being afraid. So there's the courage. Okay. Mm. So there was this part where I was like, if they fire me, I don't care. Cause at that point I was so willing to just like, what I wanted was so mm -hmm. powerful that I was willing to trade certain things. And, and the things that I was afraid of, 
they were no longer strong enough because at that point I was like, I'll figure it out, you know? And I think there's a certain amount of that that comes with people who go out and do things. It's like, once you figured one thing out, okay, I figured out how to not die. Um, and then you're kind of mm-hmm. like, I can figure a lot of things out. And mm-hmm. it's almost like a forced prioritization. You realize like things that I thought were so hard were just self-perceived. They mm-hmm. weren't really as tough. So it was like reframing too. Mm-hmm. I'm like the, the, the level of the bar changed. And so that was part of it for me too, is I just kind of said it was less that I was like wanted to do something so significant. It was more that I just refused to accept anymore what it already was. And so Mm -hmm. I would, I would be willing to have, I'd be willing to come up with any sort of failure to not do what I was already doing. If that makes sense. That's very interesting. Um, because I, I commonly ask people because uh, I see a lot of people who, like on my shows and podcasts like a lot of people who have done so many courageous things and I always ask about where they find the courage <laughs> they always they always kind of like wonder like I don't know if it was courage um but in my perspective I do I do think um that takes courage and um specifically maybe just like a shift in willpower and like this awareness that your willpower is beyond your circumstances yeah Um, well and I think for me it was also like threshold and faith like mm -hmm. my what I was willing to accept had changed Mm -hmm. and then I, I my faith had also strengthened so perhaps that's where a lot of the courage came from was this belief that like you know who I call God brought me here Mm -hmm. so surely he's not done yet so Mm -hmm. I know that I'm not gonna stay here I know, so I don't know yet where I can go, but I'm willing to try. Mm-hmm. And so perhaps that. that was a combination of faith too. Yeah. So this might seem like a very simple question, but I do know that just knowing some of the people who are going to be watching this, I think they will really appreciate me asking this. So what is the difference between effectiveness and efficiency? Yeah. So I think efficiency is perhaps um, speed. Are we increasing our acceleration, our rate of return? Mm -hmm. And effectiveness is, are we um, having efficiency on the right things? Mm -hmm. So like, are we, are we getting those things done in a way that reaches the goal? So maybe effectiveness is to me more of like, we're not just doing things fast, we're doing the right things fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And um, thank you so much for all of this. I just would love for you to share if you have one message you feel compelled to share with the audience today, what would that be? Oh, um, that you can do it and mm-hmm. that you may not know all of it, but just take the step that you know you can take. And if you aren't sure what step that is, start with making a plan every week. That is usually a pretty sound step. So every Friday, make a plan for the next seven days and start there. And that will be such a significant building block that so much great change will come from that. So take the step you know you can take. And if you don't know what it is, start with weekly planning. Thank you so much, Samantha, for coming on today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Great chat.